This is TTT Live. I'm Mahalia Joseph Wharton. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Suite 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, Al Alexander. Good day, viewers. Welcome to today's virtual media conference by the Ministry of Health as we update you on the national COVID-19 response. Our presenters this morning include the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, the Honorable Ch Fitzgerald Hines, Minister of National Security, Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health, Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director, Epidemiology, Ministry of Health, and Professor Christine Carrington, Professor of Molecular Genetics, Virology. And we also have Dr. Michelle Trotman, National Clinical Coordinator. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and I will be your moderator this morning. I now hand you over to Dr. Roshan Parashram, CMO. Good morning, Al. Um, and good morning to the Honorable Ministers, to Dr. Hines, Dr. Trotman, Professor Carrington, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. So I will be giving the clinical update this morning. So if you can have the, the graphic up, please. Um, just we will begin. 122,901 tests conducted thus far. Over the last 24 hours, we would have reported 171 new positive cases taking our total since March 12th to 9,135. Our total recovered patients thus far, 7,996. Total active cases now stand at 982, with 718 of those in home isolation at this time. Our deaths are now at 157. Total patients in hospital, 86. At step-down facilities, 7. And at quarantine facilities, 287. Just to give you a little breakdown as the hospitals, what we have is again 86 as a total, with 53 of those being housed at the Kuva Hospital and multi-training facility, one person ICU, three in the high dependency unit. At the Cora Hospital, we have 15 individuals, and at the Scarborough Regional Hospital at the Fort, there are 18 persons at this time. In our quarantine facilities, um, 310 in total, and these are spread amongst the Cape of Hotel, 61, Cascadia Hotel 22, Chancellor Hotel 18, Regent Star 15, Cara Suites 17, Trade Winds 31, at the Napa there's 16, Day Bay Halls there's one person, Canada Hall 41, and Freedom Hall 74. So all that brings me to the end of my brief clinical update for this morning. Thank you very much CMO. We now go to Dr. Hines. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Good morning to the Honourable Ministers, to my colleagues, to members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. We will continue with the slide set that we, uh, that we just began, uh, looking at now the epidemiologic data. So if we can have the next slide on, we will see the progression that we have been noting. Uh, at the bottom, at the right-hand side, we see that upward curve that is becoming a little more steep in its upward incline, and it is meeting more of the aggressive projections shown by the yellow, uh, the yellow line that extends beyond the end of the blue bars, showing that we have actually picked up peace, and that that, pick, that advanced peace has been maintained over at least the last couple of weeks. And this is a cause for concern because this represents a surge in the rate of transmission. Uh, next slide, please. What we are seeing, as we always demonstrate with the epidemiologic curve or the epidemic curve, next slide, please, is that the rolling average, that dotted line that runs through this graph, has continued to move upwards. We see the heights of the bars on the right-hand side becoming progressively higher. So we're seeing more and more cases on a daily basis. And that rolling average climbing steadily. Next slide, please. The other thing that we note, and we look at the same data but aggregated by a week, we see that the background, that salmon-colored portion that represents the percentage positivity, meaning 
out of the tests that we perform, how many of them come back as positive. We see that that has actually climbed to 25%. We can't see the axis very well here, but that has climbed to 25% in epidemiologic week 16. Bear in mind that we're currently in the middle of epidemiologic week 16, so the height of that bar doesn't represent a completed week. We expect that bar to surpass epidemiologic week 15 by a significant amount. Next slide, please. The demographics that we have been describing are, as we have described in the past, with the deaths being accounted for by 75% of them being males, and over 70% of them, or around 70% of them, being in that above 60 age group. While, next slide, for the overall cases, the overall caseload still maintains almost a half and half in terms of its male-female distribution, if we move to that next slide. And that male-female distribution uh, being 53-47 or so uh, has been the pattern throughout the epidemic with the majority, over 55% of them, being in that 25 to 49-year age band. If we continue on, we see the geographic distribution, and I'd like us to take a look at the upward trend. We're looking at those yellow dots, and the number of yellow dots is proportional to the number of new cases for each week. So as we move to the next slide, we move from week 12 to week 13, we see that the yellow dots increase in number and distribution widely. Uh, so whereas we're seeing them mostly in the county, Kearney, Victoria, and St. Patrick, as we move to week 13, next slide, we see that that east-west corridor uh, began to accumulate large numbers of cases, while large numbers of cases continued in the previous counties of Kearney, Victoria, St. Patrick. Next slide, please. That trend was continued again in week 14. And in week 15, next slide, we saw that it actually spilled over into the eastern counties that had been largely spared previously. So if we move to that next slide, we see suddenly a larger number of yellow dots in that Nerva Mayaro and St. Andrew St. David uh, area. So we are seeing that widespread community transmission. Next slide. The other thing that we show is that upward trend by county. We're just seeing that the bars moving from left to right for each county get progressively higher, and that some counties exploded or had a much larger proportional increase compared to others, which is what the figures at the top of the graph represent. Next slide. Of importance, we saw some large numbers over the last couple of days between Sunday and yesterday. If we look at the next slide with the maps, we see that the blue dots represent Sunday and the green ones represent Monday, Tuesday. And we are seeing again that countrywide distribution that indicates that we are again at widespread sort of generalized community transmission and that the numbers, the numbers of dots again are almost proportional to an entire week's number of dots previously. So there is that upward trend, that surge that we are concerned about. And uh, this is the point at which we look at the pattern of distribution. The patterns of distribution have really been that where we see the spread of cases, we're seeing places that keep turning up in contact tracing, including workplaces, including sometimes places of worship, including uh, previously the indoor settings of bars and bar hopping that we had spoken about previously. And we are concerned that the adherence to that mask wearing, physical distancing, not gathering, is not as, as good, as strong as it was previously, possibly due to fatigue, but we're seeing where that change would have been represented in these numbers. The other driving factor would have been the large congregations that would have occurred two weeks ago around the Easter period that we're now seeing the effects of as this week's figures roll out because we're seeing that two week gap between Easter and now being followed by that large surge, which we'd spoken about before and which we're now experiencing. So this is the general epidemiologic picture. I'm going to turn you back over to Mr. Alexander. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Sobering information. We are pleased to welcome back Professor Christine Carrington. I now invite her to speak on the presence of COVID-19 variants in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Professor Carrington. Thank you and uh, good morning to members of the panel and members of the viewing and listening public. So many of you would know that on Monday, using genome sequencing at the University of the West Indies, we detected the presence of, the SARS, of a particular SARS-CoV-2 variant of concern 
in a local sample received from the Ministry of Health via CARFA. Now, the variant we detected is known as P1. It was first um, detected in Brazil, so it's sometimes referred to as the Brazilian variant. And that um, variant has now been reported in, in about 40 countries, in some cases associated with community spread and others only in travelers with no or limited um, onward transmission. Now, before I discuss what we know about P1, and why it is classified as a variant of concern, I'd just like to explain what variants are, how they arise, and why some of them are of concern. So when a person is infected with COVID the COVID-19 virus, which is SARS-CoV-2, the virus enters their cells and replicates to produce millions of new virus particles. Now, during this process, um, millions of copies of the virus's genome are made. It's genetic material. And that genetic material... Um, that genome is incorporated into the new viral particles. Now, the mechanism that the virus uses to copy the genome is not foolproof, and occasionally you get errors occurring, and those errors are known as mutations, so that the genome of the new virus particles, some of them could be slightly different from the original. And the appearance of mutations is natural and expected, and it is a mechanism by which the virus um, evolves into different, uh, many different lineages. Um, now, a virus with one or more new muta mutations is sometimes referred to as a variant of the original virus. Now, the vast majority of mutations have little or no effect on a virus's ability to cause infection or, to, or disease, but occasionally you do get mutations that arise that affect the virus's properties. For example, a mutation might cause a virus to spread more quickly or less quickly, or it might cause the virus to cause more severe disease or less severe disease. Or you can also get mutations that influence the way the virus interacts with the immune system. So over the past year, as SARS-CoV-2 uh, mutations have continued to accumulate, we have begun to see emergence of more and more variants with new properties, some of which are of concern. Now, there are currently three major variants of concern, including P1, which I mentioned, the Brazilian variant. Um, can I have the first slide, please? So this table here shows the three main variants of concern. B117, or the UK variant, which was first identified in the UK, is on the left. Um, B1351, first identified in South Africa in the middle. And then P1, P1 in the last column, highlighted with the red box. Now, the main concern about P1 and also some of the other, the other variants is that they contain a large number of mutations, including mutations in a part of the virus called the spike protein. And that, that spike protein is a major target for, protective, for the protective immune response. And it's also the protein around which COVID-19 vaccines were designed. So you can see here in this table that P1 has 11 mutations in this region. Now, lab laboratory tests have shown that because of these mutations in the spike protein, the P1 variant is less, a little less easily neutralized by antibodies produced in response to infection with other non-P1 um, variants. And as a result, it is possible for people to be reinfected with this variant. They've seen that in Brazil, if they were infected with a, an another variant, another lineage of the virus before. However, very importantly, as we can see here in the table in the row about immune evasion, this resistance to antibody neutralization is not as great as observed in B1351. That's the one that was first identified in South Africa. Also, in terms of vaccine efficacy, which is the next row down, um, while there's evidence that some vaccines may be less effective against P1, a, recently um, a recent scientific article that is yet to be peer-reviewed showed good evidence that antibodies from people who had received the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and also those who received the um, mRNA vaccines, their, their um, sera, the antibodies in their sera were able to effectively neutralize P1. So on the basis of this, um, it is expected that um, those vaccines will offer sufficient protection against P1. And it's also important to remember that even in cases where there is reduced vaccine efficacy um, against a particular variant, the vaccines still work well enough to um, protect against severe disease, uh, hospitalization, and death. So even where P1, the P1 variant is present or the other variants are detected, it is still worth getting vaccinated. 
Now, with regards to transmissibility, there is some evidence that P1 is more, a little bit more transmissible, but the extent of this, transmiss this difference and whether it is actually, um, uh, uh, it was observed in Brazil, whether it is an inherent property of the virus, which means you'll see the same thing in other countries, that needs to be confirmed still. And the impact of P1 on disease severity or the duration of infection, that is not clear yet. So how do we prevent this P1 variant from spreading? Exactly as we would prevent any other um, SARS-CoV-2 um, lineage or variant, all the other ones we have that are in circulation. The answer is the same. So wear your mask properly and consistently. Keep your distance from others. Avoid mass gatherings. Practice hand hygiene and get vaccinated. Thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Carrington. We now go to Dr. Trotman, National Clinical Coordinator. Yeah, so we, again, we, we note the information that was shared with um, Professor Carrington. And one thing that resonated is that despite of the variance, the variance it is very important to be vaccinated. We also notice that she mentioned that it is important to wear a mask over your nose and mouth when you go out in public. All right, and keep your distance from others and stay home, ladies and gentlemen, if you are ill. We now go to, we now go back to Dr. Trotman. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All protocols observed. Dr. Carrington has, doc, Dr. Carrington has left the opening for me to again emphasize our public health measures. Public health measures are put in place by societies, institutions, communities, and individuals to slow and stop the spread of infectious diseases, and in this case, COVID-19. It is absolutely essential as we see our numbers increase that we adhere to these guidelines of, of, of distancing, wearing our masks, and practicing hygiene. I want to thank those who have been adhering to these guidelines. And I want to ask everyone else who have not been doing as well to get on board. Remember that the mask, when worn properly, is extremely effective and if you do not get together in congregations there is no medium by which this this virus can move from person to person simply put it is very important as we continue to get vaccinated that we remember that we don't drop these public health measures that are put in place to stop and slow the spread of virus. We think as a, as a group that part of what we are seeing with our increase in numbers has to do with improper wearing of the mask, congregating, and also a relaxation because the vaccine is here. We're happy that it's here. And we want to encourage all to go out and take the vaccine as Dr. Carrington has illustrated, it is effective and it will work, but it works alongside our public health measures. Last and not least is Dr. Hines may have mentioned that we are tired. There is pandemic fatigue. The world has, world has been facing, facing this for more than a year. There are things that we can do. Take a minute to breathe. Relax, inhale, meditate. Know that at the end of the road, this will get better. Do a little less of screen time 
particularly looking at some of what you, you, you receive because it's not always information that's processed the same and correct way. So in closing, please remember DSM. Distance, sanitize, mask, even as we continue to get vaccinated. And remember, do not congregate. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Trentman. Distance, sanitize, mask. I now hand you over to the Honorable Terence Yal Singh, Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to my colleague, the new Minister of National Security, the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, also Dr. Michelle Trotman, and Professor Christine Carriton. Thank you for sharing your decades of expertise with us this morning, and also Dr. Avery Hines. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Members of the media, good morning. You would have heard the experts um, inform the public this morning about the patterns of spread, the sources of spread. You would have heard the experts speak about the new Brazilian variant. You would have heard Dr. Trotman once again appeal to the country as to how we should uh, conduct ourselves. All of this is part of the ministries and the government's continuous evaluation of how our measures are working or not working, trying to gauge the public response. Some of the data and the information we look at, and it is so sad to see responsible persons when we should be pulling together as a country, pulling together as one, because the virus does not discriminate by race, religion, or geography, or socioeconomic standing. Um, try to confuse the public. All our measures are based on the data we have presented, the contact tracing. You would have heard Dr. Hines speak about places of religion, bar hopping. Dr. Alana Bess spoke about that about a month ago, I believe, about bar hopping and places of religion. We look at our hospital occupancy rates, which is now 27%. At one point in time, about a month ago, it was 2%. It is now 27%. We look at our doubling rates, and most importantly, we try to gauge public compliance, which is the most effective measure to keep cases down, public compliance. So the evidence, which cannot be ignored, has been presented. The duty of the government, and this morning, the team would have met, led by the Honorable Prime Minister this morning at 9 a.m. The team included myself, leading the Ministry of Health, which included the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Michelle Trotman, Dr. Avery Hines, and also included um, Minister Stuart Young in her capacity as Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister and my colleague, the new Minister of National Security, Minister Fitzgerald Hines. So we looked at the evidence which has just been presented to you. And we as a government have a solemn duty to continue to protect the population, protect the most vulnerable, especially the elderly who bear the brunt, who face the most critical challenge in keeping them alive. We want to protect our children, and we want to protect the long-term economic strength of Trinidad and Tobago. To that extent, led by the Honorable Prime Minister, I have been authorized by the Honorable Prime Minister to announce the following measures, which will start from Thursday, the 22nd of April, as soon as the new regulations are presented to me for signature and vetted, by the Honorable Attorney General. These new measures, which come into effect from midnight tonight, together with the measures we started last week, Wednesday, so all the measures will end at the same time on Sunday, 16th May. So all measures, the measures that were implemented last week, Wednesday, 
the measures which are to be impl implemented from tonight will run until Sunday, 16th May. We try to strike the proper balance to reduce congregation, to reduce congregation as much as possible. The measures are there will be no public gatherings for entertainment and concerts. No public gatherings for entertainment and concerts. The public service will revert to 50% on a rotational basis. This will be led by P.S. Murray Sweet as before, and all P.S.s and divisional heads will make the recommendations as to who will come out on which day and how staff will be rotated and which staff will work at home on which day and which staff will come out to work physically on a particular day. This will have the effect of taking a few tens of thousands of persons off the transportation grid and collecting in offices because you would have heard in the past that office spread Workplace spread is one of the areas. At this time, we are not touching the workplace in the private sector. This only applies to the public sector. But we appeal to the private sector to maintain the vigilance that you have been. Also, places of worship, which we know from empirical data and contact tracing for the past two to three months. Um, will be reduced from tomorrow from 50% capacity to 25% capacity. Services, prayers will still be at 90 minutes. The only thing we are asking is that it be reduced from 50% to 25%. In making this adjustment to places of worship, we make a special appeal that in places of worship where you attend your prayers, to keep on your masks at all times. Do not take off your masks for any reason. And once your services or prayers are finished, please don't congregate. Please go home quietly. This is a time for deep introspection, and we ask persons who attend places of worship to please comply with us. Weddings and funerals will now be limited to 10 persons. So weddings and funerals will now be limited to 10 persons. We, again, we know this is a difficult time, but in trying to prevent spread, we all are our brother's keepers in all of this. We at the ministry will continue to monitor and evaluate and we urge the public to please comply so that other more restrictive measures don't have to be implemented. We could avoid that. I want to echo what Dr. Michel Trotman has stated because it cannot be ignored. Pandemic fatigue is not a TT issue. It is a global issue. People are tired. People want to go back to how life was in January 2020. But as yet, we cannot do that. We know people are tired. We know people are frustrated. But you know what? The virus is not tired. The virus is not frustrated. The virus is alive and kicking all over the world. Just look at what is happening to second, third, and fourth waves around the world where ambulances are once again lining up in rows of 10 we don't have that issue here. Hospitals are running out of oxygen. We don't have that here. Our health system has proven to be resilient. And at this point in time, I want to congratulate once again all, every single healthcare worker for their response to COVID-19 and now their response to the vaccination drive. I am getting nothing but praises from members of the public who go to be vaccinated and are talking about the care and attention and the excellent customer service they are getting across our 23 or 25 
facilities now and we'll be ramping up that in the future. So thank you healthcare workers once again for stepping up to the plate. But Trinidad and Tobago, we need to protect our healthcare system. We need to protect our healthcare workers by not giving into uh, pandemic fatigue. And as Dr. Trotman has said, and as all uh, persons charged with the responsibility of leading this response, we know we sound like stock records for those of you who know what a record is. But the only way, the only way to treat with this is mask wearing. You see this is armor number one. Washing your hands, social distancing. Do not go to work if you are ill. Do not go to a place of worship if you are ill. Do not go to a bar if you are ill. Avoid the congregations. Avoid having people come into your home who are not part of your immediate web or contacts. Even your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, you don't know where they have been. And if we come together once again, as I know that we can, these ugly numbers that we are seeing, we can get it back down within two, three weeks to a month. Let us set that target for ourselves. Let us set a collective target as Team Trinidad and Tobago, that by the end of May, the middle to the end of May, if we adhere to these measures, we can see these figures uh, lower significantly so that we don't endanger our healthcare system and we don't put our long-term economic survival at risk. So, uh, Al, I want to thank you for the past few minutes. I want to thank all those members of the public who have been cooperating and ask those who have not been cooperating to jump on the train. Work with us. Come together as one Team Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Team Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister. We now go to the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines, the Minister of National Security. Thank you very warmly, Mr. Alexander. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Alexander. Thank you very much, Minister Dial Singh and the team of supreme professionals who spoke before me uh, here today, well known to the national community. Interestingly enough, on this day, 51 years ago, Trinidad and Tobago was in social and political, and to some extent, economic turmoil. But a lot of good came out of that. Today, 51 years later, we are in a bit of turmoil dealing with an insidious, invisible, deadly disease elaborated upon by those who just spoke before me. Minister Dayal Singh pleaded with us to get on board and to observe the things that have been repeatedly demonstrated to us as useful to protect our lives. The regulations that we speak of today that are subject to the adjustments outlined by Minister Dayal Singh are necessary in order to protect lives. They were made with compassion and an understanding of the economic circumstances that they generate, an understanding of the tiredness that Minister Dayal Singh spoke about. But notwithstanding that, we know from our ordinary human experience and observation, that there are those in the society, in the world, who will completely disregard these regulations. Hence the reason for my presence as Minister of National Security here today. To give the Minister of Health, to give you the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, the assurance that in recognition of the behavior unlawful behavior of some of our citizens disregarding all of the things that we heard so many times in this morning, we will exert our best efforts to ensure that the regulations, the law, is securely enforced. In those circumstances, Minister Dayal Singh, I have been mandated by the team 
that met to look at these regulations this morning, led by the Honorable Prime Minister, to summon the necessary strength to ask the police commissioner and his senior divisional commanders to gather with me in a short while after this press conference where I will ask them on behalf of the team that designed these regulations to implement and to practice best efforts to ensure that these regulations are enforced. Unfortunately, enforcement is necessary. So, in respect of the regulations about wearing masks, which include improperly wearing them, and in respect of the gatherings based on the adjustments that have just been made, I give you the assurance that in meeting with the commissioner and the divisional, police divisional leaders in a very short while, I will be sharing with them the request of the team to ensure that action is taken over the next three weeks, the life of these new regulations, to ensure that the laws of Trinidad and Tobago in this regard are properly followed and enforced. Special teams of police officers, we expect, will be put together division by division, Tobago, Port of Spain, San Fernando, Central, all of the nine police divisions across Trinidad and Tobago. And I will be asking them to report to this team on a daily basis their activity in terms of the enforcement of those regulations, where people will be made to feel it in their pockets if they practice the unthinking behavior of disregarding the security and the safety of all of us. So the circumstances that prevailed in 1970 were very different from today, but it requires nonetheless enforcement, and I give you the assurance, and here inform the national community, this is where we are at, and we expect the police to take action to enforce these regulations for the good and benefit of every single one of us. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We now move to our question and answer segment. Our media representatives, please begin by stating your name and the name of the media house that you represent before posing your questions to our panelists. In order to allow us as, as many media houses to participate in the question and answer session, we are limiting the number of questions to two per media house in the first instance, and if time permits, we will allow one additional question for media representative. Ladies and gentlemen, we now go to Guardian Media. Hi, good morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. My two questions this morning are for the CMO, Minister of Health, and Minister Hines. Okay, so my first question is, can we have some more details about the case in which this Brazilian variant was found in? And does the ministry have any um, information so far via contact tracing to suggest that this variant may have seeded itself within the population? And my second question now to Dr. Hines, I mean, uh, Minister Hines. Um, in the past, the CMO has indicated that our second phase of infections, which has now trickled into this possibly third wave, was sparked by illegal immigration. So, uh, Minister Hines, what are you going to do differently? What are you bringing different to the table that your predecessor may not have that could prevent and, po and possibly protect the country from this threat? So, Dr. Hines could speak about the contact tracing of that particular case, and then we go to Minister Hines. Dr. Hines, contact tracing for the variant. Thank you for the question. At the current time, with the active contact tracing that has been happening and with the active testing of anyone who would have been uh, determined to have been in contact, there isn't currently any evidence of seeding, and the individual in question is currently in isolation so that onward transmission is prevented by restriction of movement. So to answer your question very briefly, no, there isn't any current evidence of seeding, but we continue with the contact tracing and the testing of known contacts 
to look out for any other possible uh, cases within that contact circle, and we'll update as we get additional information. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. We now go to the Honorable Minister for the second question. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Alexander. Um, Mr. Khan, we are not persuaded that the problem that you identified and we are dealing with necessarily is as a result of uh, or exclusively as a result of illegal migration into Trinidad and Tobago. And the evidence, as I offer it in support of that, you have countries like India, like the United States, mm -hmm. Brazil in particular, that are severely afflicted by spikes and phenomenal figures in this regard. And they don't have the problem that we have in terms of illegal immigrants in respect of Venezuelans. Because I too have heard this conversation in the national community, and it is largely focused on Venezuela, not too far from here, and the illegal migration in that regard. We are not altogether persuaded that that is the case. They don't have that problem in India and in Brazil and those places, and therefore um, I don't know if that uh, mini thesis is accurate, but um, in so far as our borders are concerned, we, with the resources we have and with the laws that we have to protect us in that regard, will continue to exert best efforts to ensure that all who come to these shores come under controlled circumstances as we have established them so that they will not pose this threat to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. And thank you, Minister. We now go to 98.1. We are not hearing. Could you put on your mic? Could you adjust your mic? Good morning uh, to you, Mr. Alexander. Uh, Stephen Cummings, 98.1 FM, and uh, good morning to the uh, panel. Uh, just my uh, two uh, quick questions, um, and I wanted to sort of take off from um, my colleague there, um, Mr. Khan, and, and uh, you know, press that, that uh, issue further, uh, this question um, on, on border protection as it, um, it was posed to Minister Hines. Minister Hines, uh, first of all, congratulations on your new uh, appointment. Um, I want to press the point that um, there, there's this continuous um, narrative of porous borders, and um, we have been seeing a spike uh, in, in cases. Um, I, I want to, you know, to find out from you, uh, apart from what you have stated, what else, um, what is, uh, is there something new that you uh, bring to, that you would be able to bring to the table to avoid, um, you know, to, to shield us from, from possible, you know, um, importation of, of, uh, of the virus, additional cases. Uh, and uh, uh, another uh, question I have here for uh, Minister Dial Singh. Minister Dial Singh, um, the, there was, a, uh, there was uh, some movement in terms of um, uh, looking at uh, the construction of a new facility, and I'm talking about Central Block. I haven't um, heard much about um, you know, the progress about uh, Central Block, where we are um, at this time. Is it that you were able to give us an update um, on uh, that particular facility? Because I know that would also um, impact on our um, health delivery. Um, some timelines, um, I'm not sure you know, how far we are. Can you give us a progress report on that? Thank, Thank you. you, and I will take the part of the first question because um, uh, Mr. Cummins, again, sadly, um, you try to connect the spike in cases to porous borders. Let us be clear, the spike in cases has more to do with the behavior of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. We keep pushing this narrative that we ought to blame others for our behavior. When I visit hospitals, when I get the data, it is Trinidadians and Tobagonians lying down in our beds. We have one Venezuelan in a hospital bed. So I think it's really unfortunate where we try to link the spike in cases to Venezuelans when the facts and the evidence simply 
do not lead us to make that conclusion. So I just want to put that on the table and Minister Hines will deal with that. Uh, you wanted an update on Central Block. Central Block is proceeding as planned. I pay periodic visits. I was there two weeks ago. 396 piles have been driven. All the um, subsurface work has been done. We have one last major concrete pour to do. Um, the target right now is the same as it has always been for delivery in October 2022. So nothing has changed and everything is working according to plan so far. Okay, thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Cummins. Just like we do, this team and the government do in respect of management of this COVID threat, we rely on the findings, the opinions of the experts. I have only now approached the Ministry of National Security and I would rely on the experts in national security to advise where they may consider it necessary on matters of border security and more part well border porosity in terms of the COVID issue is sufficiently answered by Minister Dial Singh and therefore I have nothing useful else to add. In respect of border security, generally speaking, I would be listening to the experts that I will encounter in the Ministry of National Security and would be guided in terms. Thank you very that much. Is. Thank you very much, Minister. We now go to AZP News. Hi, good morning, Prior Bihari, azpnews.com. Let me first say... Um, um, so congratulations to Minister Fitzgerald Hines on your appointment. And, and maybe I can ask that same question to you. Um, it, it concerns the borders again. We have had the borders closed for more than a year now. Cases still have seen to be increasing. There's seen still an upsurge. And we even have the Brazilian variant. So therefore, can an argument be made that the closure of the borders is not working properly in that sense, and therefore we can relax some of the measures when it comes to the borders? That's my first question. And my second question, I don't know if Dr. Dr. Hines could give us some of the specific areas where there are the increase in the COVID-19 cases. Thank you. Well, Mr. Bihari, I have listened to the submission of the Minister of Health, who is more than familiar with these issues, intimately familiar. And he has established for our attention very clearly that the spike that we have seen and we are seeing involves circulation of this virus inside of Trinidad and Tobago, and he said so on the basis of their observations from contact tracing and so on. So again, the basic premise of your submission is not persuasive. Let me put it that way. And therefore, I have nothing else that I can usefully add. I would content myself with the factual submission based on the statistics and based on the submission of the Minister of Health in that regard. Until those facts change, your question is not uh, persuasive as a cause of this issue. The, the, uh, the other part of the equation uh, prior, which you, have to address, which you have to address, is to ask, if the borders were closed, what would have been our position? If the, if the borders were open, as you, are, as you are positing, what would have been our position? Our hospitals would have been overrun, like other countries. Regular hospital services would not have been able to be had. So it is not only important to ask, that the borders are closed and we have high numbers, you also have to ask, if the borders were open, what would the effect have been? So the government is taking all necessary measures to protect you, your loved ones, and all of us by closing the borders and having people return in an orderly, controlled fashion. Thank you very much, Prior. Dr. Hines, could you take the second question? 
slide back up that I had presented, but to answer the question very briefly, Mr. Bihari, what we would have seen in, the, in that map was a distribution of those points across all of the counties, and it is really just reflective of widespread community transmission at this point in time, and therefore the widespread application of the public health measures by everyone is really the response that is needed. Everyone needs to do the things that will help to reduce spread because the spread is taking place in all the communities, in all the counties, and there isn't a specific targeting from a geographic perspective that would be relevant at this point in time. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Radio Tamron, we are ready for your questions. Radio Tamron. Good morning. Good morning, George Lee Cork, Radio Tamron. I hope you're hearing me properly. I have a question regarding the vaccination. Uh, there are individuals who, in consultation with their doctors, are unable to take the vaccination that's currently on offer. Uh, people with bleeding conditions, people with tendency towards blood clots, um, people with uh, thrombocytopenia. Is there an option available or would the state consider an option of bringing in another variant of the medicine for those persons? Or would they consider allowing the private sector to do that? Or if the individual had the capacity to bring in those medicines themselves, that those individuals could uh, and are able to source the medicine, which could be difficult, would they be given permission to import it for their use? Thank you very much for your question. Um, the chief medical officer would address. As it relates to um, your concerns, of course, if you're a physician and we have advised persons that once you have a comorbid condition that you seek your advice of your medical practitioner before you actually have the vaccine, so it's very good that people have been doing that and picking up issues that their physician have been saying to them that you can't get the vaccine for whatever reason, whatever medical reason. Just to correct um, a little bit of a statement that you made, you said, would we allow persons to bring in other vaccines that don't have a similar effect? And I think you're speaking about thrombosis. So the WHO vaccines that have been approved thus far, just to remind the population, the Pfizer vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, all have been proven by studies to actually have very similar rates of thromboembolic phenomenon, which is four in a million or five in a million in terms of number. So having another vaccine would not change the issue as it relates to that particular concern that those individuals have. But what we can do, of course, is follow the advice of your physicians and maintain the other public health guidelines including mask wearing at this time. And CMO, just explain that this is why we need to achieve herd immunity. So those course, who sir. can be vaccinated are vaccinated sure. to protect those who cannot be vaccinated. Just yeah, explain so, that mean, again, please. Yeah, I think Minister said it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically we're looking at, and, and that's the point of herd immunity really, is to protect the vulnerable ones that cannot um, vaccinate themselves. WHO vaccine so far as you know, are really for people above 18 years of age. So we have a whole herd of people um, under that age that need to be protected by all of us who can take the vaccine, and we are really asking people to do so so we can form that protective herd among our vulnerable population. Thank you very much, CMO. We now move to the Trinidad Express. Good morning, Kim Bojram from the Express. Minister, given where we are again, can we ask if going forward the data being given to the public could probably be um, changed up a bit so that, for instance, the very unfortunate deaths that we have seen, condolences again to all those families, can we start being given perhaps a breakdown of uh, not patient details, but age, gender, um, maybe any chronic, you know, the, the chronic diseases as they would have gone, probably to also start giving the population a better idea 
of who is being affected. Some of that has come out in the past. I hope that was clear. Minister Hines, so you, uh, just to piggyback on, on what Friar would have asked, are you in January, sorry, let me start over, in January, a new uh, repatriation system, a new application system for exemptions was launched. And there was an impression that it would be a little bit more streamlined. But, and we are seeing that people are being repatriated, yet the media is being bombarded by people abroad, older people, sick people, people working abroad who say they have a legitimate um, cause to come home. They are not deportees, they are not resident abroad trying to return, and yet still they can't get any sort of hint of the exemption and are feeling lost in the system. Uh, so these are real people coming to us. Do you have any plans to look at that system again, maybe overhaul it at this stage? Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Dr. Hines will take the first. I'm a little perplexed by the question, however, because we on a daily basis give the age and sex breakdown of the persons who have passed on. And in addition, we have posted on the ministry's website some additional detail with respect to aggregate data, but yet disaggregated a little more by age, group, and sex for the chronic diseases that have been represented among the fatalities. That data will be updated as we've had additional deaths since the last time that our data set was shared. But that data resides on the Ministry of Health website and the age sex distribution for the deaths was presented this morning and every morning since we've been doing the press conferences. So hopefully uh, those listening will be able to know where to look for the information that you've requested. Ms. Budram, in my briefing with the former Minister of National Security, Mr. Stuart Young, I came to understand, and even before that as an observer in the national community, with access to some of the information, I came to understand the rationale, the raison or death, for the controlled uh, arrangements uh, for, in terms of repatriation. And as Minister Dayal Singh explained a while ago with great clarity, it is all designed to ensure for all of our sake in Trinidad and Tobago that our health system is not overwhelmed. One aspect of that is the quarantine capacity of this small island state called Trinidad and Tobago. Our quarantine arrangements are what they are and it is with that as well in mind that these controls are maintained. I am aware from my briefing with Minister Young that we have had hundreds of persons in the circumstances as you have just described them repatriated to Trinidad and Tobago, beginning with those who were genuinely caught when the borders were closed early last year, again with a view of protecting all of us. So that this is an ongoing activity, and quite naturally, as he explained, it is looked at on a very almost daily basis because you continue to get interfaces from members of the public on these issues. So that I would, like him, continue to look at this constantly. And on the question of revamping or rearranging, as the question suggested, I cannot now say whether that will be necessary. All I can do is assure you that like Minister Young, those of us who have this responsibility in the ministry would continue to look at it with a keen eye on trying to bring relief to those who are affected by virtue of being outside, generally the persons who you have described. You have those assurances. Thank you very much, Minister. Minister Delsing, we noticed on social media there have been questions on, on um, the restrictions in gyms. Could you elaborate? Sure. So, <laughs> thanks, Al. Um, so my my WhatsApp is, has has been lighting up about to clarify the position on gyms, bars, and food. So we have not touched gyms, so people are free to go to gyms. Just adhere to the measures. Um, uh, places with uh, serving food and uh, bars and so on, 
your establishments can go on operating as they have been since last week wednesday that is take out no in-store dining however again we appeal to persons that we all need to be responsible in how we use the gyms how we go to bars to take out our alcoholic beverages and don't congregate outside the bars on the pavement with your masks off and speaking to each other please there was a photograph i believe outside a bar on the news day front of the news day last week we have four gentlemen with their with their favorite beverage in hand and all of their masks were off in close proximity to each other talking that is where the spread happens so please we just ask persons to be responsible but we have not touched bars we have not touched gyms and food establishment since last week wednesday and the new measures don't affect them today thank you very much thank you very much minister uh, we now go to cl communications tv6 sorry TV6, we are ready for you. Hi, good afternoon. We're not cutting TV6 News. The first is I'd like to um, raise, I would appreciate input from both the Minister and the newly appointed Minister of National Security. We are seeing a memorandum circulating which originated, which seems to suggest that soldiers will be mandated to take the vaccine. And I know the Minister would have said on on many occasions on this platform that persons cannot be forced to take a vaccine. So I would just like some feedback on that issue from both ministers and also to Minister they are saying, you know, to, you know, you said a short while ago that you are not seeing any Venezuelans on hospital beds. But given that we have a significant Venezuelan population and COVID-19 is in community transmission and discriminate, could it be that seeing Venezuelans coming forward into the formal health sector or what do you think is the rationale? Thank you. So I will take the second part first and Minister Hines will go to the other part. What I said was in response to a question trying to link the current spike in cases to Venezuelans. There is no evidence that the current spike is due to the presence of Venezuelans. That is what I said. Um, and I did say we look at our hospitalization figures and there has been no um no large amounts of venezuelans in our beds i think currently we have one the point i was trying to make and i hope this point is not lost is that everybody in trinidad and tobago all 1.4 million of us we have about what 16,000 registered 16, venezuelans uh, but we have a population of 1.4 million. So let us contextualize the narrative that we put out there. It's 1.4 million citizens that we see liming with their masks off, that are inviting people into their homes to have parties, weddings, christenings, birthdays. It is mainly Trinidadians and Tobagonians in places of worship. So let us contextualize everything properly and not get into xenophobia and trying to blame our circumstance on a group of people we are all in this together so i thank you for the question and i now hand over to minister heinz to deal with the other issue thank you very much madam cutting uh, the general rule has already been stated based on the laws of trinidad and tobago that the question of whether one would take or not take, have or not have the vaccine is a very individual and personal thing. That remains largely unchallenged. Uh, the army, by definition, is a group of men and women operating together and doing certain things together. Um, and therefore, they have their own regulations. They are guided by the Defense Act, and they do their thing in a certain kind of way, an ethos that might be different from the one you operate at TV6 for obvious and sometimes security reasons. The, put, the position is that I am not briefed on that news report that I, like many members of the national community, may have seen last evening. But my cursory glance at what I heard on the television 
and what I read without having had the opportunity to interface with the leadership of the Defense Force this morning to get the specific details. My cursory reading of it did not suggest that it was being forced on anyone. It was simply from my reading of it, a situation where if persons, soldiers, did not take the vaccine, that fact would have been reported to higher elements in the army so that they could continue to make decisions and plan their affairs around that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Minister, for that clarification. We now go to CL Communications. Hi, good morning, Natalie Singh, CL Communications. Concerning the vaccine rollout, I was wondering, um, outside of the COVAX and India's donation, do you have any update on when and where we will get more vaccines? And then my second question is, um, do we know how many people have applied to come back home and are on the wait list as an update, just to, um, to make sure that I, we have a, a more current update. And lastly, has there been any evidence from the contact tracing concerning the Brazilian variant that suggests that restaurants are a source of the spread? Thank you. Okay, so thank you. I will deal with the first question about update on vaccine negotiations. So I do in fact have before me a five page document that uh, Pfizer, they have confirmed since March 9th that some doses are possible. Uh, we have another meeting with them next week. AstraZeneca, we had meetings in October. Um, they, will be, they will not be able to supply us bilaterally until possibly September 2021. Um, that is what they are saying. Serum Institute of India, if you follow the news coming out of India, Serum Institute of India now possibly cannot even supply vaccines for their own domestic population. At one time, they were supposed to be the vaccine manufacturer to the world. They are, in fact, the largest vaccine manufacturer, and we continue to be in bilateral talks with them um, and also with COVAX. Moderna. Moderna has told us that they cannot supply until quarter four of 2021. Sanofi, we had a meeting on January 21st, 2021. Their clinical trials are still ongoing with WHO. So therefore they have not even yet applied for EUL or EUA. Sinopharm, our bilateral talks are very well advanced. We have signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement with them, so I cannot go into details. I want to protect that source of vaccination by not breaching the non-disclosure agreement. But Sinopharm is expected at this time, and don't hold me to that, for EUA or EUL by the end of April. Johnson & Johnson, they are not entering into bilateral agreements which are part of COVAX. So we are part of COVAX, so Johnson & Johnson's position at this time is that, at this time, they are not entering into any bilateral talks with any country that is part of COVAX. Barrett Biotech International Limited, which makes the Covaxin vaccine, we had a meeting on April 5th, and um, we have signed a non-disclosure agreement with them on April the 14th. So again, I am debarred from discussing that in public. African Medical Supply Platform, as of April 19th, which is two days ago, Trinidad and Tobago's order is firmly confirmed. And once deliveries commence, available vaccine doses will be shared equitably to all participating countries. Our current confirmed order with the African Medicines um, supply platform is Pfizer 250,000 doses, Johnson & Johnson 625,000 doses, which will give you in total 875,000 doses. Now, you would know that I think Johnson & Johnson has currently paused in the United States, which adds a further layer of complexity. 
But the, the good position about Johnson & Johnson, once they are cleared regulatorily, is that it is a one-jab vaccine. So we keep our fingers crossed. The COVAX facility, we have received information in the past few days that another supply of the COVAX through the COVAX facility um, is expected in May. We will get confirmation of that in talking to PAHO up to this morning within a couple of days. Uh, the donation from the government of India, as you know, 40,000 doses of Covishield vaccine has in fact been received. The donation of 100,000 from the government of China, again, it is still predicated on the Sinopharm vaccine receiving its EUL or EAA, EUA from uh, WHO, which is expected, hopefully, and we keep our fingers crossed, keep our fingers crossed, by the end of April, which is a mere uh, week and a half away. So that is a total update on where we are with every single vaccine manufacturer and facility we have been engaging with over the past several months, since October 1st to up to two days ago. So I hope that gives you a very complete picture of where we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I now invite Dr. Heinz to answer the second part of the question. The answer to the question, the short answer to the question is no. In the contact tracing around the P1 variant, there weren't any uh, restaurant sites or, uh, involved. But as we like to remind individuals, there has been international evidence for general transmission of COVID-19 that identifies that indoor spaces, including indoor restaurants, etc., are potential super spreader sites, hence the rationale behind the public health measures around those. I hope that clarifies. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the Q&A segment. The Ministry of Health thanks you for joining us for today's COVID-19 update. We trust that the information shared this morning was informative and beneficial. Remember that even though we continue to have high uptake for the COVID-19 vaccine, we implore you, the public, to continue to follow the health guidelines. Remember the three W's, wash your hands, wash, watch your distance from others, and wear your mask. Thank you very much. This is TTT. Live for local.